I think it's recording. Yeah, it is. All right. Um, welcome to um, Dr. Multi Trading or how I learned to stop worrying and love threats. You know, um, my name is Freddy Gime, and uh, I'm really, really going to try you guys to have a great time today. Uh, who am I? Really doesn't really matter that much. If you really want to see my buy and stuff, you can just go online and figure it out. Let's say that I'm a guy that knows a little bit about multi trading because of his work and his experience and stuff like that. Having said that, my big thing is who are you? You know, and you know, we have usually for this kind of talks we have essentially J two EE developers who are like, you know, scared about, you know, you know, they're spooked about multi trades because of um, the specs, because J two E is a don't even use anything that is a multi-threaded, you know. And then we have the J2C developers that are spooking general because everybody says multi-threading is hard. And then we have, you know, Android people and the people that are working with Harmony that said, hey, well, you know, we didn't really need multi-threading until now, we, which we have dual, uh, dual core, you know, cell phones. Um, <coughs> but more importantly, you know, we have fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, people that really will do something else than worrying about multi-threading. And if there's anything that's coming out of this meeting is, or this presentation is, you know, to learn what it is, not be afraid of it, and, you know, go to bed at night saying, you know what, I understand it, I have no reason to fear it, it's going to be fine. We're not going to, we're not going to die. So what are we here for? You know, you are the hero. I'm just a little green guy. <laughs> so we're going to go to training, and we're going to, after the end, we're going to master the force of trading. So, um... With that, we're going to start with what is considered the first problem with multi-threading. That is scary. You know, it even looks worse than what it really is. I've never seen Darth Vader on fire, but that's awesome. You know, that, that shows really the magnitude of how fearsome can multi-threading can be. But at the end, we have to remember that Darth Vader wasn't a bad guy. He was just a little bit misguided, right? You know, he had a good heart at the very, very, very end, and I hope you discovered the good heart of trading at the very end as well. <coughs> so the first question, you know, when we deal with multi-trading is, why should you even worry? Which is a, a very, very basic tenet. It, it is a fair question. It's like, why would I even worry about threats? You know, one of the things that people say is like, you know what, if I don't see it, it really doesn't exist, you know? The second times, you know, the J2EE spec says, don't even use them anyways, you know. Um, a lot of people have this conception that multi-training makes things worse, that some people actually think it makes things slower, uh, makes it more difficult to debug, makes it, uh, you know, it, I tried it once and locked up my database pretty bad. So, so there's, there's all these concepts that people say, you know what, I don't even want to deal with it. And I, I really, uh, you know, if, if it's not there, I don't need to worry about it. I don't need to do anything about it. And um, the truth is more complicated than that. Um, if you have a program that runs threats, you are dealing with it. It doesn't matter if you decide to ignore it. It doesn't matter if you decide to just close your eyes. But it's really there. And, and if you're using a Swing app, if you're using database connections, if you're using EGB, if you know about garbage collections, you know, if you have legacy apps to maintain, threats are there. And there'll be something that you have to essentially face up <coughs> as you go in your, in, in your stuff. And now, multi-training is, is, the problems that happen are, the, the hardest part is that they are the li little spooks at night, in the sense that things sometimes happen and they disappear. It's not reproducible. Something s happened once, you rebooted the server, and then it was fine. And then you never had to go back to it again. And, and usually that's a sign that there's a threading problem underneath it. So, you know, it's, it's really even if you don't see it, it, if you're using any of these technologies, it's really there. And it's, it's our job to have software developers to at least understand what's going on. You know, uh, a lot of people say, well, the J2E doesn't allow it. Um, that's not quite true. There is Work Manager, which allows you to split tasks. Um, and there is the Land of the Brave. So for those who really, really embrace threading, there is, re is really a solution. Like any other thing, is the technology that can help you out. And, um, and there's a lot of things that you can gain from threading your application. Um, so um, 
we're going to walk down that path. Um, a lot of people say multi-training makes things worse, and um, I'll say it depends. A chainsaw can make things very bad, <laughs> or it can be beautiful things. You know, that's chainsaw carving. That's awesome. Um, but wha what it means is, is, is it is a tool. If you use it too well, you can do things that are impossible to do any other way. <coughs> a lot of people have said, you know what, if I need multi-trading, why don't we just wait until CPU performance doubles and then I'm done with it, or add a new server, or, or whatnot. And um, you know, we know that Moore's Law doesn't hold anymore. A lot of people are, you know, like the, uh, the, uh, the uh, microprocessing industry, hardware industry is saying, you know what, we're not going to make things faster. Well, we're going to just add more of it. So that's why we have the dual cores, four cores, exa cores. You know, now you get a server, you at least have 12 cores. So, so things are not, things are not growing in speed, but they're just having more of them. And that usually requires you to start thinking about threading possibilities and, and how are you gonna, how are you gonna, you know, allow your program to scale that way. Okay, so after going over this argument saying, why don't you have to worry about it? Then you're like, okay, fine, I, I worry a little. But it's scary. You know, a lot of people find threading the hardest problem in computer science. And it is, it is not definitely not easy, but uh, but you know, it it is something that you can actually conquer. You know, a lot of people say, you know what, it reminds me of the depression question in college, and then I really didn't like the teacher, and uh, they say I know I don't even want to start with it. So my story was that I graduated from Guayaquil, Ecuador. You know, there's a South American country. I came here to study. I didn't have the culture. I didn't have um, I didn't know the language. Oh, I knew a little bit of the language. I didn't know a lot about it. And I was very scared. You know, I came here and tried to study on this thing. And um, one of the things that we did is we borrowed a lot from the French and the Italians a little bit, in that when we greet somebody from the opposite sex, uh, we greet them with a kiss on the cheek. You know, it's normal. Everybody does it. It's strangers, you know, grandmas, everyone. So, so um, uh, when I came here, I learned two things very quickly of the American culture. First one was personal space, and the second was sexual harassment. <laughs> <laughs> but I made it, in the sense that you know I, I understood it. I, the, I could navigate college. I became a well-functioning adult, and now I'm here teaching you about uh, multi-trading and keeping the personal space. So we can learn this. This is this is not something that it's out of reach for no one. So, uh, and hopefully this will be the first step to understanding all of these things. So, <coughs> with that in mind, then I'm gonna tell you why do you want to learn multi-trading? You know, you know you have to learn it because you, you're scared about it, but there are real things that multi-trading brings. One of the things that, that allows you is troubleshooting multi-trading problems. I mean, these do happen, and sometimes they do happen on the tools that you use. You know, having a solid foundation multi-trading allows you to really troubleshoot all of these things without being afraid of what's going on. You are able to look at the code and say, well, wait a minute, there's a trading problem here, and you can solve it. You cannot be like, oh, I don't know, it's something happens. You know, now you, you know about it. You know, you avoid new multi-trading problems, meaning you code with that in mind. You don't introduce any, any of these problems. You don't introduce any of those, those you know, defects, <coughs> and you code defensively. Um, the thing, the third thing is, is you optimize code. One of the biggest benefits of, of doing your stuff uh, multi-thread sa uh, thread safe is that you can usually use tools like divide and conquer. You can use more processors. You can scale out, you know, with your software. And and that just 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 are the things that you can do when you learn to master it. So there's the re the reason why people are pushing for multi-threading is because that's the way people are going, uh, like that's the way the industry is going. But also because for us is another tool that can make our programs to be better. Now, as we walk down this path of learning, the very first thing is you mustn't learn what you learned. And the reason why I say this is because uh, if you have any, like, any exposure to threading from the interwebs, it's probably wrong. <laughs> like, there's this guy, uh, I, this is a post I found, I was, I was trying to do some research about for this meeting. And he is very well-meaning, and, and he really said, try, try, try to do a, se uh, a, a service to the community. He posted online, you know, he put his name out there, 
And, and what he's saying, essentially what he said is, doesn't matter the number of threads that you're going to use, your program is still going to run on the same time as if it has only one thread. And I'm like looking at it, and I'm trying to think of, there are cases when that happens, but it's, very, very, it's a very specific case, and it's not really applicable to, to what he's talking about. Most of the time, if you, if you know what you're doing, if you split things in threads, they run in parallel. They run faster. You know? and, and, and that's one of the things. If, if you're in this meeting, if you, if you brave the weather, you, know, you make it this far, the one other thing I'm going to ask you is on learn what you have learned about threads. Because it's most likely it's probably wrong. Uh, there might be stuff that is right. But at least we're going to walk together to get to the right place as we learn these things. Uh, Pix is here. You guys want to start getting it before we go into what threats are? Yes. All right. So back to business. Where were we? So what are threads? Threads are paths of execution, right? At the very beginning, I call old school, there was code that run on one CPU. So, and this was what you think happened, it is exactly as you think it happened. It's, you know, one line of code got translated into assembly language, it got executed in the processor, next line of code got translated into, into, pro into uh, <coughs> you know, assembly instructions, it got executed. There was nothing else going on. Then with the, uh, with the, um, as we start getting all these sort of like operating systems, then one of the things that start happening is, is we have different paths of execution. You have you know, code for the OS and code for your program still running on one CPU. And one of the ways, I, I listed round robin, and I know if there's, a, if there's a lot of computer science gurus that say, well, it's not round robin, there's many ones, there's, you know, uh, there's unfair um, schedulers. But what it is, 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 is the CPU will have this scheduler that will say, okay, it's your turn to run. You run for a little bit, and then it interrupts and says, now it's your turn to run. And then you know, it splits the program that way. Things will still happen the way as if they were single-threaded, in the sense that for you, for your mindset, the code is still run, executing line by line, is still getting translated into assembly language, is still going to the CPU, is still doing the stuff it's supposed to do. Now, this is where things got start getting interesting. Um, when we started introducing multiple CPUs, then there started being code that was round robin around <coughs> different CPUs. Sometimes CPU A, being me, you know, says you're going to run, and then, then CPU B, being <coughs> Simon, says you're going to run. But then s when they're done and we get interrupted, maybe Simon's going to take part of the code I was running, and then I'm going to take the code that he was running. And the thing that happens is when you start getting into that level of complexity where the round robin happens across CPUs, then you start getting these side effects and things that are not quite, not, you don't quite understand that happens. This is where it starts getting more fussy in terms of what you look at the screen, your code, and what's happening under the covers. So in the beginning, the paths of execution were as you expected it. Your code, run, even if they have 100 threads or one thread, it was the same thing. You look at the code, whatever it was executing, it is executed on the CPU. But the thing is, the, the hardware industry decided we need to be faster about these things. We need to make code run more concurrently. We need to do tricks to make code run faster on the CPU. And this is where things started getting muddy. Uh, one of the, the things that they discover is that a memory read and a memory write to main memory is a hundred to a thousand, uh, as, as orders of magnitudes. Usually, I think it's a hundred to two hundred uh, times slower than the CPU execution clock. So what that means is, if you're trying to, if you have a variable a, you know, says you know a equals b, right? Then you know when the CPU runs an instruction, it's like, oh shoot, I need to go fetch uh, fetch b from memory. Then it has to go shoot down, stop the stop the presses, wait two hundred cycles until the memory until the memory read happens and then get the what B had it and keep running your program after that. So one of the things that, that starts happening is, is a lot of these like, uh, hardware uh, vendors decided we're going to put cache in front of the CPU. So instead of being 100 times slower, it's only 10 times slower. You know, and, but the, the, they don't have to go out all the way to memory all the time. 
And then uh, that's going to introduce a bunch of problems when you think about your code. Now, I'm going to use this example a little bit over and over again. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to exam examine what, cash, what are the caching things that happen behind the scenes. I'm going to tell you what the problem is with this code. And then I'm going to give you a little bit of a solution for that particular problem. I don't want you guys to get hung up too much on the solution. That's almost for completeness, because it's something like, you know, if I don't give the solution, people are just going to be, so how do I fix this? But, most, but what I want you to concentrate the most is how knowing this changes the way you see your code. I want you to concentrate on the problem. Now, this class here is an ID factory. It's, uh, if you think about it, it's, so it's like an ID generator. You, know? you have a current ID equals 0. And then you have a get next ID, which gets the, you know, the next ID on the stuff. And innocently enough, we do current ID plus plus, right? We increment it, and then we return it. Fairly straightforward. Um, <coughs> this code is not thread site. Now, the reason why it's not thread safe is um, you have to understand, and I apologize for the site, but we'll go over it, that if we have Imagine that we have two threads, right? Two paths of execution that are running. Two people that wanted to get the next ID, right? So, you know, thread one starts here, thread two starts here. They're both like, oh, the CPU, CPU one says, oh, we need to read from main memory, right? So the CPU one says, oh, they want to read from main memory because we need to get the current ID and then we need to increment it. So it goes out and fetches from main memory. And then fetch the number one, right? And then gets it on the cache. Now, thread 2 goes out, does exactly the same thing. It goes, it's going to go out and get from main memory. It's going to get the number 1, because nothing has been written yet. These two are running concurrently. Nothing has been written. And then thread A decides to increment it and, and commit it to, to memory. But what happens is, when thread 1 does this, the cache takes control and says, you know what? I'm not going to write to memory right now. You're just going to wait a little bit until I have enough things to write to memory to then write to memory. You know, so then you have thread A saying, I think I have number two in memory. You know, and then thread B didn't see the number two. He saw the number one because it wasn't written. And then he thinks that now he has number two on, on, on its own local cache. So, so the thing that happens is, is that because of the cache, your changes are not visible. And this is called, you know, this is. All right, so we're going to continue. Uh, this is the part that didn't get recorded. But uh, don't worry about it. We're just going to go over it again, and uh, you, you'll understand it all. So um, what this is called, this is called a thread visibility problem, where you know, the, the <coughs> essentially it's visibility and or publication. So, so you know, thread A tried to say, you know, I think I have this value, I th and I think it's committed to make memory. But thread B really, you know, never did get it because, you know, it, it, it failed to publish. You didn't see the publish that thread A did on, on the, uh, the stored value. And that's, I mean, that, that's for that slide. And, you know, slide 28, if you, if you look at, at, at what's happening when you do current ID++, in reality, you know, you have the first, there's really two operations that are happening there. The first one is is current ID. You need to get what the current ID is, and then say, okay, after getting my current ID, I'm gonna get the number, let's say, you know, 15, and then I'm gonna say, okay, now that I retrieve 15, I'm gonna increment it by one, you know, getting 16, and then so that's another operation, and then the last operation is writing it out. And and right now, because of of the new you know caching that there is, really, you're never hitting the main memory. You're always hitting, or most likely, be hitting the main cache. Now, how do we overcome this? Uh, how do we how do we tell the threads, you know, like like or or you know, when a thread is reading or writing, that you know, I don't want you to go to the cache. I want you to really verify that this thing is 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 what it is. And and that's what I, that we said about you know the keyword volatile. The volatile what the volatile will do for you is say you know what. Forget about any of this local caching. If uh, if a variable is declared volatile, it means that we're gonna go out to main memory. And, and read it always from main memory. And every time that we have to write it, we're always going to write it to main memory. So um, when you declare something volatile, you skip the cache completely. And, and, and in that sense, you, 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 know, you have the cache, and you're always getting what the real value of that, that uh, long is stored, or that the variable is stored in main memory. 
Now, um, Devonta will solve the problem of what is called uh, safe publishing. So, so what that means is is um, is is you're 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 really publishing out there. You're really writing to the main memory. If somebody else is reading it, they're going to read it from main memory. You know, and starting on JDK five. It solves some of the atomicity problem, which is something that happens. Um, uh, it, it, it happens with with longs and doubles. Um, now let's talk a little bit about atomicity. What it really means is that um, that sometimes you want certain operations to be atomic. You know, um, if you think about it, you know, every instruction you write in Java gets gets broken down into like you know bytecode and the bytecode gets in, in, turned into machine code. Now at the low level there's um, memory operations you do on them. You know, and when the JVM um, spec was crafted, uh, there were certain guarantee of memory operations in the sense that that um, they say if you're gonna read or write a single and an int, a byte, those are gonna be read in one step and there's gonna be written in one step. You know, there's nothing that can go in between those. But um, what they say is long and doubles because they have so many bit, so many bytes. Um, do they are allowed to be broken down into two reads and two write operations? So if you're reading from a long, the chances are um, that you know your JVM will say you know I mean you are going to be doing two memory reads out of it, and when you're writing a double or a long, you're going to do two memory writes on it. And this is important because. Um, when you look at, at, at like for example, uh, current ID plus plus, really what you're doing is is you're doing two read operations out of main memory, you know, not just one. And you might be you might be hitting the cache, um, you know, if it's not volatile. But but essentially what's happening is you're you're actually doing two memory reads, and then after that incrementing it, then you're doing two memory writes. Now, if you think about this, you know, in a multi-threaded environment. You know, you have a thread one, right? It thread one read, read the first half of the long, you know, the first, you know, the most significant bytes. You know, thread two decides to write because it's, it's writing something as, uh, as it was as it was uh, <coughs> executing. Now it was turned to write stuff to memory, and it wrote the first and second half of the long. You know, and then thread one went back and read the second half of the long. So if you think about it, now you have you know, uh, thread one read first half of the long before it was modified, then thread two modified the long completely, and then thread one read the second half of that completely modification. And sometimes this generates values that are completely weird and out of sequence. You know, as, as you're turning, you know, as you're looking at it, you know, sometimes if you're zero out bits or doing some masking operation or you're going negative or any of these things, suddenly you have something like, you know, it was incrementing 15, 16, 17, and suddenly you have minus a billion. And the reason why what is probably because you interweave or or or, or interleave uh, this this reads versus writes. You know, you read half of it, somebody wrote the new thing, and then you read the second half after they wrote the new the new the new values. So um, that's uh, and that is what what happens when you have you know this sort of like non atomic reads and non atomic writes. You know, again, volatile um, starting on JDK five. Um, uh, guarantees that you know when you're reading and writing along, uh, you're doing it atomically, and because they, they they figure out you know if you if you're declaring uh, a long volatile, you're probably trying to make it thread safe. One of the one of the other things that we're gonna say is like you know what if you're reading along, um, and there is volatile, we're just gonna make the two reads happen atomically, meaning there's no there's no way that somebody can go in the middle as you're reading the first and the second part and write something in it like we show in our example. So um, with that in mind, you know, have our, all our concurrency problems been solved? And the answer is not really. And the reason why is because um, we can actually do atomic reads and writes, but there are things that are happening uh, in between our read and write, right? So, so for example, let's say that we have, you know, um, Thread one, it reads the first half of the long, it reads the second half of the long because we declare it volatile. You know, let's say that thread two decides to write the first half and the second half because thread two wrote it, uh, read the uh, value of the long earlier, and now decides it's, time, it's now my time to write it. And then when it writes it, it's to say, you know, like thread one and thread two read the same value, they read one, right? 
Thread 2 now is going to write 2, and it wrote 2 out to main memory, but Thread 1 now is going to write 2 as well. You know, it's going to, you know, so what happened was that these two people, or these two threads, uh, people, yeah, threads being people, right? Um, these two threads uh, <clears throat> read the same value even though they were not supposed to. You know, thread one was supposed to read it, modify it, set it, and then thread two was supposed to then, after you set it, read it again. And this is what we mean by being um, atomic, in the sense that that we can, while well, we can do atomic reads and atomic writes, we're not doing the whole operation as a one atomic unit. So uh, how do we overcome this? Uh, and this is one of the biggest things in in uh, in when you're looking at threading problems, and that's why this is worth me coming back and actually you know filling in the slides. You know it's because of this particular slide. Check then act, and what that means is that if you see any type of operation where you're checking for a variable and then acting on that check, then what that means is that that particular section of code needs to be atomic. It needs to be protected. It needs to be um, uh, uh, all put together in one so that nobody can can do anything with the, the variables that you're touching while you're on this check then act sequence. And, you know, and like we say, you know, uh, if you look at current ID, really, there was an atomic read and there was an atomic write and there was a modification in the middle. You know, so so <clears throat> between the read and the write, anything could have been happening, and that's what we talk about. That that, that needs to be protected, and and when if that needs to be protected, then what we're talking about is getting uh doing a synchronized block. Now, what a synchronized block means is that um, within that block, only one thread can get in. If there are threads waiting, um, they're just gonna be you know essentially. Once you get into synchronized block, so it's a thread executing it. Only one thread will get in, uh, and then all the other threads will have to to sort of like wait in queue until that thread gets out of the synchronized block. And this is the part we hand off back to our original radio station or original recording. Uh, hope you enjoy it. Thanks. This code. There's, there's, you know, anyone else will have to wait. If somebody else wants to come in, they have they're gonna wait until you release that that block. And then after I release that block, then those threads can come in, you know. And it's uh, <coughs> and also as a bonus because when you declare a block synchronized, it also works. Or it also acts as what is called a memory barrier. A memory barrier means that it's an special instruction on CPUs that says, you know what, this guy was dealing with threading problems or threading visibility. So whatever is in your cache, doesn't matter what it was, make sure it flushed to main memory. So every time a synchronized block is, is, is present, it usually also means that you have a memory barrier present that allows you to flush your cache to main memory. So one of the easiest way, it will be just to declare public synchronized long get next ID. So when we do that, then any other threads that are any people that try to get IDs will have to wait until the synchronized block is done. If 100 threads are trying to get it, thread one will get the lock, will execute, um, when it's done executing, then thread two will go in and execute. You know, it, it really serializes the, the it serializes the operation in that nobody can do it at the same time, and you have to wait for it. Now, a little cleanup that we have to do in our code. You know, if we're using synchronized, like we said, it enforces a memory barrier that it means it, it, it flushes the cache. Then, when you do such. You don't need to say that your whatever it is on your synchronized block doesn't have to be volatile. You can remove. We could remove the volatile because things after the synchronized block uh, block are gonna be flushed to main memory. So our um, <coughs> our uh, ID generator will sort of look like this. You know, again, it's this is a thread safe implementation. It's um, easy enough. There's nothing complicated going on in the sense that you know, it's just incrementing. You're protecting that synchronized block because these are operations that you want to make sure that they're executed as a unit. And, um, <coughs> and that's that. And I'll, and I'll explain, elaborate on how do you synchronize a little bit later on in the presentation. Now, there's another thing that happens when you're dealing with threads. Um, the guys at, at, at the poor engineers at Intel and AMD 
because they, they, they wanted to do this arms race of who can execute things faster, they start doing things that are crazy. In our terms, as software developers, it's crazy, but it works. And one of the things they did is code reordering. The code that you have on the screen in front of you will not execute the way that it looks like. <coughs> and the reason is, if you don't declare it to be thread safe, if you don't have any thread semantics, what it's going to do is it's going to say, you know what? I'm going to bunch up the writes, and I'm going to bunch up the reads that your program is doing so that I do those, opera those in batch operations. And so what happens is, is you get things like this not working. If you don't uh, specifically protect it, you know, um, you run into problems. So in this particular case, threat one is doing a very complex operation, right? It takes, you know, minutes, days, hours, who knows? You know, and then I have a Boolean variable that I said done equals true, which means, hey, I'm done. Now, thread two is, let's say, that is looping every now and then, and it's checking, is the thing done? You know, and if it's done, then it's going to system up, print line, the operation result, right? Straightforward enough. If anyone look at this code, you know, they say, oh, that makes sense. You know, done is true. You know, it's going to print out the operation result. There's no way that the operation result is not ready when you're inside a condition. But what happens is, because you didn't specify any threading, sem any, any threading semantics, what the, and, and, you, and the CPU didn't expect this code to be multi-threaded, then what it did was the following. It says, you know what? We're going we're gonna to flush the DON the to main memory because I'm flushing things out. But for whatever reason, they decided to keep the operation result because there is some ca concept of cache locality where operation two is being modified in the next instructions or is being read on the same thread or is, you know, for whatever other reasons. So then operation result didn't get published to main memory. So then thread two, when it starts reading these things, it's like, oh, okay, if it's things done, it thinks it's done, and then it's going to print a result that is not even there. So that's one of the things that what I mean where, where you have to be aware of it. If you don't, it, even though the code looks normal and the codes make sense, once you start dealing with threading operations, you have to look at more of, of what am I doing together that has to stay together. You know, in this particular case, I'm doing two things together, right? I'm, setting the, I'm checking the operation result that is done, and I'm setting it as done. So it's another check the not operation. I need to protect that. <coughs> You know, and how, how do we overcome this? Like we said, you know, synchronize and bot and will solve this problem because they, they enforce memory barriers and both of them will essentially, you know, synchronize is even better because it really is like only one thread will go here, only one thread will go here. So, you know, it would make sure that what you're doing on your first, when the first thread is done and you get out of the synchronized block, those two variables are set on main memory. They're not reordered. Nothing is going on with them. And when this, the second thread comes on the other one, checking if the stuff is done, it's going to retrieve from main memory as well. It's not going to look at its local cache. It's going to retrieve from main memory and make sure that everything is ordered. The publishing of the state of your variables is consistent and is not reordered. All right. <laughs> For look, he's getting a cram because that's the only picture I could find. So then, as Yoda said, a little, a little you must stretch. You know, so everybody goes like this. Ah, uh, come on, stretch out, stretch out. You know, it's hard. You messed up. Oh, look at that. As, as long as we keep recording, we're good. Is it recording? Yes, all right. We survived. We're thread safe. Two people working on the same computer, you see? All right. So this, is, this ends the very first part, which is, you know, now you know much, much more than everybody else that thinks they know multi-threading. The real things that are messing you up or tripping you up on your programs is L1, L2 cache, you know, atomic memory reads and memory writes. Some operations takes two memory reads or two memory writes. You know, atomic checks and act, meaning like sometimes you're, d even when the things look like it's one instruction, you're really doing two. You know, and then code reordering, which is, you know, when, is, when the CPU decides to, since it's not aware that you care about the way things get executed, then it decides to reorder your code. <coughs> so if you know these things, then you can, you can at least start suspecting when code is going bad 
Or if people have this, this, this strange notion that, oh, look, at the, the code makes sense. There's no problem. With, there's no trading problem with it at all. And then you're like, well, I think you're doing an I++ here, and that's a check the NAG operation. It's like, what? It's only one line. It's only one instruction. Not really. You know better now. So, you know. On the next part, um, now that you have a very solid foundation why you should really need to pay attention to multi-trading beyond the code, we're going to go to at least two solutions to multi-trading. You know, uh, and that's what I said. Don't pay too much attention to the solutions I'm describing, because I'm going to go at least over them uh, later, about, later on the presentation, which is what I'm getting into now. <coughs> but, uh, but in reality, it's at least you have some, some utility out of this. You know, now you know, you know to recognize what their threading problems. Um, one of the questions is, Will any of this happen if I have a single traded application? And the answer is no. If you're doing all the operations from the same thread, um, if the all methods are the same thread, if all the variables are the same thread, uh, the guys at Intel and AMD say, we're going to make it consistent on your same thread, meaning you don't have to worry about committing to main memory, because even if it doesn't, if your thread keeps running, the thread, when it gets executed on the CPU, will get executed on the CPU with the cache that the thread was running with. So what that means, let's say that my thread decided to say I++, you know, uh, for whatever reason, you know, another thread gets executed, and I++ didn't get it made it to main memory, it was on the CPU cache. When I get on park out of the CPU, it's on parking me, and it's making sure that either the cache comes with me, or you know, it gets committed to main memory, so next time I keep executing, I know where my I was. So <coughs> the, uh, the, uh, the Intel guys, the CPU guys is said, if you're really single threaded, you don't have to worry about anything, because we're going to make sure you still run the same way that you were running before. <coughs> and now the, sec the second thing is, is, is or, or, or as you go now back and start looking at code, the first thing, now that you're aware that you're probably dealing with multi-threading applications, is to ask, is this piece of code multi-threaded? Is it being used by many different threads? And th there's a couple of ways. There's one who is explicit, where you see it evidently. You see uh, thread pool executors, which is like a sort of like a multi-threaded J2, you know, concurrency package utility. You know, if you see singletons, you know, things that are, you know, they're only one. And and there's probably tons of threads using that one, you know. Then that's another that's another uh, one that needs to be multi-threaded. If you have used factories and the factories are static factories, where you know it's essentially the same as a singleton. You you have one of them serving all your application, and you know that your application spawns threads somewhere. So then you know that explicitly you are ha you're carving or you're dealing with multi-threaded code. Sometimes you deal with multi-threading implicitly. You know um, some other thread that is not that thread you. Wrote you know, it's calling a method of a method that you wrote. So, you know, if, if you have to be aware that, oh, somebody is using me in a multi-threaded way. I didn't, but somebody else is, just because either it could be either they didn't know that my stuff was not multi-threaded, or they it just happens to be legacy code that happens to be, you know, maybe that's the way they, they decided to write it. You know, if you ever use Swing ever in your life, if you have to put a GUI on, on the screen and J2AC, as pretty and beautiful as it is, you have dealt with threaded code. Swing is, is even though it's single threaded, the stuff that happens behind the scenes, your application is a different thread to what your application usually runs in. Unless you're doing only callbacks and your swing application is, is fairly, you know, it doesn't do a lot, then you might be single threaded. But if you touch swing, chances are is you're, you're doing stuff that is multi-threaded. Especially if you run into, for example, invoke later, invoke and waste, swing worker, these are things that scream you are doing multi-threading application. <coughs> now, even if you're looking at single-threaded code, one of the questions that will come up is like, why would I even want to worry about it? You know, if, if I think my code is running single-threaded, and I think I'm the only one using it, why would I want to make it thread safe? Why do I want to make it multi-threaded? And the reason is, uh, at the very basic, divide and conquer. That's the biggest bang for the buck. Usually when you create code that can be threaded easily, then you immediately gain the benefit of splitting that code into units of work and let many CPUs work on it at the same time to arrive to a result. So, 
that, that, that is one of the things that, that you gain by making your code thread safe. You know, um, another one is, for example, you know, if you're working with Swing or one of these like, you know, uh, graphic frameworks, a lot of them say, and they, they scream at you at this. They say, please, 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 don't do anything expensive on the main display thread. You know, it's, it's called, you know, AWT thread and Swing, you know, whatever it's called in the, the, the other frameworks that there are. But they tell you, because what happens is, if you do, I cannot look responsive, meaning, if you're using Swing and you're displaying things, the buttons and, and it needs to shading and it needs to move stuff, if you're using that thread to do database operations, if you're using that thread to retrieve uh, you know, a web service or you know, call a web service, the calls will block the Swing thread, the GUI thread, to draw and be responsive. So a lot of the times you want to thread your application for that reason alone, just to make things faster or to seem faster. <coughs> and that's just a couple of the things that you get with um, with with um, multi-threading, you're n if you want to make code multi-threaded, there's a lot of things that you can use. You know, we went a little bit over volatile synchronized. There is immutability, <coughs> which is a, an excellent tool for making your code not just thread safe, but in general, it's easier to understand. You know, there's locks, there's lock-free structures. You know, there's atomic lock, atomic end, there's concurrent map. There's all these things that you can really get into if you want to make your code very, very performant in a multi-threaded. Gosh, even database. If you know your database can be your huge lock. You know, not desirable all the time, but it works. You know, if you need to write things on the database and read from the database and consider that your main memory, go for it. You know, I mean that's that's one way to solve it. Having said that, you know, all these tools are a big chainsaws. So if you don't know how to use them, you can create a lot of damage. <laughs> so yeah, I know, it's a disturbing picture. Sorry about that. So and this is an example of what happens. What happens is when we get burned by our first threading problem, the first reaction is, you know what? Shoot, uh, shoot. I just want everything to be synchronized. And everything's going to be volatile. Because that way I know it's, 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 it's going to work. And and I've seen code like this, where it is, seems like, you know, helplessly, it's like, synchronize, synchronize, synchronize. Every method is synchronized. They even put in the comments on the top of the class, make sure every method is synchronized. And yes, you can do that. <laughs> That's the same as having a single threaded application. Actually, it's, it's actually a little bit worse. Because what happens is with single threaded applications, um, the CPU doesn't have to worry about any threading contention, and it just says, you know what, I'm not going to worry about it. Once you do everything synchronized, not just that your code runs single threaded, but it's always checking, is there anyone else out there? Is there anyone else out there that is going to come and get my log? You know, I need to be ready for that. I need to always commit to main memory because I think somebody might need my main memory. So, you know, you make your application actually worse. And this is the, the tough part. When you do stuff like that without really paying attention to or like understanding exactly what synchronized is doing, you can have even worse problems, which is deadlocks. You know, it only takes a synchronized block that makes a call to another object that has another synchronized block. Both of them are holding what, they, what you need to release. Both of them make calls to the other one. And suddenly, your application just decided to quit for the day. And I have very long nights trying to figure out why it decided to quit. <laughs> then I wanted to quit. But <coughs> but I, I, it, is, it is one thing. If, if you're going to solve a threading problem, you do want to understand the mechanics behind it. And you do want to apply a serious fix to what you're doing. And I'm going to give you the easiest fix that there is. In terms of multi-threading applications, the easiest way to make an application thread safe is to make it immutable. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. <coughs> Scala guys and Lisp guys from the very beginning of time, and anyone that used functional languages, knew this trick from a long time ago. Immutability brings threat safety. <coughs> uh, because by definition, they never change. So, you know, if I create an object that it doesn't change, it doesn't matter if it's cached on main memory or not. You know, if it's cached on the local CPU, the values are the values. I cannot change them. So, you know, if four CPUs read the same object, and you know, then they have it on their cache, but nothing really changes because I cannot write to that, that object. I cannot change it. So it's, it's by definition, <coughs> it will be thread safe. 
Now, in terms of Java, you know, what that means is you probably want to declare everything that your, your class has as final. You know, the final keyword means that if you, don't dec you have to either declare it when you define the variable or a construction, and that's about it. You know, it, it, and, and, and it sort of like uh, keeps that semantic for that. Now, having immutable, having objects that are immutable cannot be enforced in Java. And this is where I get a lot of say, what? This is a misconception that happens where, where people think that just declaring everything final will make their class immutable. And the, the truth is, for primitives, you are correct. Once a primitive is assigned, then you cannot change it. And, 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 um, but the problem is that if you're dealing with object references and only but the trivial classes uh, do not use object references, then you have to make sure that that object reference of that object itself doesn't change. So the object that your, your, your main class is referring to must be immutable as well to guarantee immutability. So, so th that is something that cannot be done on Java. It's not a public object, final, my object, immutable. You, know, you, cannot, you cannot tell Java, just make sure also that this object that I am assigning as a final doesn't change either. You cannot do that enforcement. <coughs> so here goes a question. Um, we have this immutable class. And um, it just have a my ID, an identifier string, and a factory. All right. So we're going to go with the first one. Which fields are really immutable? By show of hands, who thinks that the final long my ID is immutable? Yes. By definition, primitives always immutable in Java. What about a private final string? Who thinks it's immutable? Ah, there's some doubts. And if it were five years ago, it would be wrong. <laughs> the guys who raised their hand. Now, uh, Java is a Java string is. Um, by all intents and purposes, immutable, unless you do some nasty reflection tricks. There's ways still to get access to the car array that is underneath the, the string that Java is defined on. Oh, Java string is defined on. But it's, 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 it's black magic. I mean, it, you really want to get to it. Like, it's, it's, what does that mean for us? Unless you're not, as long as you're not storing the secret nuclear detonation password in a string, I think we're fine. You know, it's by all intents and purposes it's immutable. How about ID factory? Who thinks that's immutable? We got a smart crowd. That's good. Yes, you know, like we said, the ID factory that we that we just went over, it actually has a long that was changing all the time. So you know, even though the reference to the ID factory does not change, inside ID factory there are things that are mutating all the time. And when that happens, a class is really no longer considered immutable. Now, the next question comes in, OK, I get it. I need to declare everything final, and I need to make all this stuff you know, not mutable. And then how do I do that? <laughs> and not so much how do I do that. I think everybody understands how to do that. But like, how do I program something useful with that? If I create my object and it's immutable, it's like, what do I do? And the thing that you do is you spawn new objects with what you want to change. <coughs> if, you, if you didn't notice this, for example, let's say I have a person class, right? I have a, per, uh, uh, a person name, last name, you know, and I want to create a new, because the person changed their last name. And then what I will do is something like, you know, instead of using the same person class, I'll create a new person class with the changed last name and assign it to like a dictionary or whatever database or whatever I'm using it. But the way, the way you achieve threat safety is that every time you need to make a change to an immutable class, you create a new class that has changed stuff and then assign it to a place where you retrieve, right? Like a map, a set, or whatever it is that you're dealing with. This is uh, the easiest way. What will happen is there's no way to guarantee that everybody saw the change at the same time. 
But as people are requesting the new, your, new, your new user class or you know, person class, they will get the new fields. And then, because they're immutable, they can just you know, read them and use them. Uh, an actual uh, example here, here's, uh, you know, like we said, person, you know, we have string first name, string last name, collection order orders, right? So you know, we start with a set of orders for this person. One of the methods I created is a method called add order. Now, the add order takes an order in and it's going to return a person object. Now, this person object is a new person object. It's not myself. It's a new one. And it, it, every time, if you're adding 1,000 orders in a very little time, you created 999 persons that are just going to be rejected, you know, garbage collected. But most of the time when this happens, it happens on the young generation, on the, e, uh, on the Eden. And it gets collected very quickly, very fast. Usually, it's not a problem. So if you're, if you're trying to make code thread safe, this should not be your main consideration. If after making a thread safe, you start seeing performance issues, then go back and see it, which I had to do for other things. You know, it, it happens to everyone. <coughs> now, we're going to go back to the next one, which I'm going to give for tonight, which is the next tool on your tool set. You know, now you know how to make things you know, immutable. And now you can correct anyone on the interwebs that said that just declaring final fields makes things immutable. Now you know better. Uh, the second thing that we're going to learn tonight is about synchronizing. And this is when you have things that need to be atomic, right? When things, th when you're doing those sort of like check the nap type of, of operations. Um, like we said, it's transactional statements. This is usually the harder one to get right or to be complete about. But uh, at least we're going to try to go over it. And then, uh, and, then, um, and then hopefully uh, by the end of this, you understand how it's being used. Uh, we're going to start first on the how. How do you get something to be synchronized? How do you get a block of code to say only one thread goes through here at a time? The easiest way is, is you, know, you declare a method synchronize. You, know, you say public synchronize void method or you know, int method, you know, like, like we did with our ID generator. Other, other um, other things that you can see is some sometimes you see synchronize this, you know, and this is really the object that you're in, you know. That's another way of, of creating a synchronized block. There's a synchronized object where where it's it's more generic, which is you synchronize on a particular object that you decided to get into and synchronize on. And I will show you a case where that makes sense. You know, actually all of these make sense in, in depending on the context that you're doing it. But <coughs> let's go over what like the first one, right? Public synchronized void method. Let's go over that and essentially let's go behind the scenes and see what really happens at the CPU level. Every object in Java has a lock. And that's the name they call this thing. Um, I think there's no better name, but this, there's, I guess there's worse names. Uh, but what it means is, is that there's sort of like this little thing that like only one thread can get, right? So if I have this glass of water, you can think about this glass of water as my lock. You know, if I give it to Simon, you know, he has my lock. And then only Simon can access my methods. You know, if I give it to somebody else, only that person can access my, leg, my methods. The, the water bottle is something that I almost like physically give to him. It's almost like a key to get access to the these things that I can provide. So <coughs> in that sense, you know, in our ID factory, when we make that synchronized statement, you know, what we were doing is a ID factory has a lock. And when the lock is acquired by a thread, you know, the lock is like, I'm red, nobody can else can get me. The water bottle, Simon has it. You know, we execute until I release, you know, Simon releases the lock back to me. And then I can give it to anyone else who's looking for it. So when we look at the synchronized statement, we're really, we are really doing shorthand form for the following statement. Really what you're saying is synchronize on this ID factory object. And when you do that, you're saying ID factory, I'm getting your lock and I'm keeping it until I'm done. <coughs> now that's, that's what the synchronized method really means. When you have something like this, what, when you have something like public synchronized long, what you're really doing is synchronizing on the object's lock. Now, when would you use this? When would you use a synchronized statement? You know, you always have to see the check then act. We went there at the very beginning. We said, you know, 
anything that, that requires a read, and then you make a change out of that, you know, <coughs> is something that you need to protect. You know, and that's, are you making a change because of a condition? Um, you know, if you're doing a, uh, you have to make sure even like the little things like I++. We saw that that, you know, having generator++ really was two operations. So uh, here's a couple of examples so you can dispo uh, spot them easily. If you're doing something like, oh, if the map doesn't contain the key, I'm going to put it. You know, if the result is equal no, then I'm going to set the result to zero. You know, counter plus plus, we went over that already. So these are like examples of check the NAC operations. So if you see this on your code, you know, that is something that probably needs to be protected if multiple threads are going into it. <coughs> and what you want to do is you want to synchronize on what is being checked upon. So, so if you're, you know, in the example of the map, if I'm figuring out if the map has this key, and if it doesn't have it, I'm going to put a new key in. You want to synchronize on the map. And this is, and this is where, where we start deviating it from, from, from what a lot of people, you know, that don't know a lot of threading does, which is they synchronize on the main object. You know, <coughs> and I explain why the problem with that is. You really want to make the, your scope of your synchronized block to what is relevant that you're trying to protect. In this particular case, you know, in the case, in the case of the map statement, you want to protect the map because that's what you're really changing. <coughs> If there's nothing that is, uh, if it's more complicated than that, and there, there are certain things that w you're checking 10 things at the same time and then making one act operation, then, and you don't find any particular one that is a good candidate for check, uh, for like getting a lock off, then you create your own. And then your own lock, every time you're dealing with one of the 10 things, you always remember, that's the lock that I need to do to make sure that nothing gets through until I'm done checking everything and getting out. Now, Synchronization is fundamental, meaning that this is something that it was built in in the JVM language and is built in by, by processors, is built in on the OS. You know, it's the most stable in that it will give you the results that you expect you to give. In the sense that, <coughs> that, that it will not, there's no magic going in. If you declare something synchronized, all the threads will halt until that synchronized block is done. You know, this is compared, for example, to live spinning, where live spinning is an operation where tricks don't halt, but they're competing to see who gets in first. So they're always spinning until, until the operation happens. And live spinning is a is, um, faster operation, but the result is not quite, it's, th there's, there's uh, other characteristics. So you might have miss updates. You might have live spinning for a long while. You might have starvation problems, it's things like that. So. Um, so in that, and that's what I wanted to construct it with. Uh, performance usually is not optimal. You know, uh, when you declare a block synchronized in terms of, 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 of things that you can do to make things you know, work faster, synchronize is the heavyweight. It's like you know, the cop that will stop the world until things get done. You know, compare that to, to immutable, immutable classes where you don't have to do anything. You know, the code doesn't even have to stop for anyone. <coughs> Now, like we said, if you synchronize on everything, you're effectively making something single-threaded. You know, and that's when we go over this, something like this, where you know, if any call you have to make has to go through a synchronized block, yeah, like we said, you're making it, making it uh, worse than what it, even a single-thread application it is, because you have the overhead of me giving the bottle to Simon and he giving it back to me. Now, here goes the why. The, one of the things that you want to do is, when you're protecting your check the knack sessions, or, or parts, um, you want to worry about your granularity. And that essentially is the size of the stuff that you're protecting. You know, if the same lock is protecting a lot of the code, that is called a, it's a coarse lock. It has large granularity, and that means that a lot of more threads will start stopping because somebody else is using the facilities. <coughs> you know, and affects the lock's performance effect. I think that's grammatically correct. Um, if, you, if you have small granularity, what that means is that more threads can go on different sections of your code without having to wait for each other. If these two threads are going to two different methods that are not protected by the same lock, then these two can execute concurrently. You know, if these two want to go to the first one, they have to wait. 
but if two threads happen to go to different ones, then they can, you know, cooperate. Or not cooperate, but they don't interrupt each other. So, you know, when your locks are smaller, you allow more threads to go and essentially execute on your code. So your trap will go up. Now let's go back to our IID generator. And let's say we have a server counter and a client counter, just to illustrate this. You know, we know how to create thread safe code. First thing we do is we synchronize both methods, right? We have, we have get next server ID and we have get next client ID, right? And we know that we have to synchronize on something. We, need, we, need, we know what that we need to, you know, memory barriers, so thread safe and all that good stuff. <coughs> if I have one thread that needs to get a server ID and a one thread that needs to get a client ID, it's gonna wait you know, if the server ID goes first, it's going to wait until the server, the server guy is done. Even though the client, if you think about it and you look at the code, the client really doesn't do a lot with the server stuff. The only thing is do it. The, the only reason we put the synchronize is to protect, <coughs> to protect the atomicity of the operations. But we sort of like have it so big that it protects the whole object. And in that sense, then even if there's two threads that are executing different things, they will not be able to go in at the same time. This is a revised version, right? And you can see this, if, if you start mucking up with the J2SC code, or actually the, the Java classes, you, start, you might see code like this, where sometimes people create objects that are new objects. You ever wonder about that? Sometimes you see, my object equals new object, and you're wondering, well, what does that do for me? What does that do for anyone? And one of the things it does, it gives you a lock, a thing that you can lock on. So look at this. You know, get next server ID is synchronized on an object, which is, you know, it has a lock. It's called the server object to lock, right? So what happens is if a thread goes into the server ID, it's going to get the lock of server object to lock before going into the server counter plus plus and returning that value. If a client, if I, if I call get next client ID from another thread, it's going to synchronize on something different. It's going to synchronize on the client object to lock. So in that sense, you know, these two threads can go together. And they can execute together. And, they can, and, and they're not going to mess up with each other because we're protecting the important part, which is the incrementals. If there's two threads that want to get to the server, to the, the next server ID, they'll be serialized. They'll be executed one after the other. If I have two threads that go to the client ID, they'll be executed one after the other. If I have two threads that are going one to the server and one to the client, they run in parallel because they don't have any business with each other. Because the lock that is protecting it is only protecting either the server side or the client side. And we don't need to protect them both at the same time. There's no reason to because they don't share anything. Does that make sense? And this is the part where Luke says I had enough. So we should wind down a little bit. <coughs> After today, you know how multi-core C++ is very, very cool. It says what is true is already so. Owning up to it doesn't make it any worse. Not being open about it doesn't make it go away. And because it's true, it's what there's there to be interacted with. <coughs> Anything untrue isn't there to be lived. People can stand what is true, for they are already enduring it. And essentially, it's a roundabout way of saying what it is, is. And what it is, is that threats exist. And you're probably running a multi threading application already. So you have to, we have to, as together as a group, learn and master this art together. And the other thing is remembering that understanding multi-threading is not just about the bad things that can happen, but the tools that allow you to do better things. Multi-threading wasn't, wasn't invented just because we wanted it to be angry at developers. It was the hardware guys playing a bad joke in us. It was because you can achieve a lot much more. You can scale out, you can scale better, you can make things so fast, so responsive, so great. It's a tool for you to use. It's nothing more, nothing less. So thank you so much. You can now have a solid foundation of what happens. You know a couple of tricks, and there's much more to do. And I think maybe we have enough for another session. Actually, we have probably enough for like 10 sessions, you know. <laughs> You know, we can discuss deadlock, life lock, lock contention, you know. It'll be up to you. We probably send a, send a poll out there if people want to hear more about this or not. You know, and if they want to hear about it here, they'll, they'll probably hear my melodious voice once again. I don't know if I want to subject anyone to that, but, you know, and that's that. Thank you so much for being here. You know, I mean, um, Java Pop House, that's my podcast. I talk a lot about threading, and there's a lot of stuff there about volatile, synchronized, 
thread contention, log dead logs, light logs, all this great stuff is there. I co-wrote the Japanese recipe book, uh, the session on trading is mine, so if there's any fault in that, then let me know. Um, I did not write the next book, that's Java Concurrency in Practice, where Brian gets his the end all be all master and commander. He's, uh, we, you know, we, we bow to him every day. Um, this is a great blog, Jeremy Manson, blogspot.com. He's a Google author. He was part of the J, he was part of the memory model um, <coughs> J2SC guy, and he really knows his stuff. He, he has very interesting posts about concurrency. I know it might not be first on your mind, but if you're embracing this, might as well start reading him. Um, a couple of things, Twitter, uh, we're at CJOC, facebook.com slash chicagojock, LinkedIn, just search for Chicago Java User Group. We're all over the web interwebs and pipes and tubes. And um, <laughs> you know, uh, you already found Meetup. That's why you're here. And if you're on Meetup, be on Meetup. And tell all your friends in Meetup. If you have uh, you know, coworkers that are doing Java, tell them also about, about us. And if you have somebody you hate, you can tell it about us too. That's fine. And cjug.org, that's our official website, cjug.org. Uh, cjug.com, where's that go to? That's uh, Cambodia or something? I think it's the Cambodia Java user group, the .com one. But um, that's it. Thank you very much for listening to me and being so patient. Yes. You spawned an error. Which one? Yeah, this one right here. So what's the point of having this object synchronized? Are you calling any methods on that object? Well, the method will be get next server ID. The method is above it. OK, but, but why are you synchronizing that object? Well, <coughs> we need, uh, when you have a check the nag operation, right. you want to synchronize on a lock. Okay. Doesn't, ha doesn't matter what lock it is, but you want to have a consistent lock that you synchronize on. No, I and mean it does, doesn't have to be on that object. And uh, this is the interesting part. Because what happens is, if I've used, I use little longs, right, which are primitives. And, and little longs, by definition, don't have a lock off. The only thing that has locks is objects. Okay. If I have used a big long, and it will have been an actual object representing a long, then I could have, in theory, I could have locked in that, well, actually, no. Because longs are immutable, so I will have generated a new long, and then I lost my synchronization there. So um, see, that's it's tricky. Um, <coughs> but what you want to do is you want to synchronize on something okay. that even though you're not acting upon it, but if I, for example, let's say that I have a reset server ID method, right? If I have a reset server ID method, I will want to synchronize on server object to lock. Because I'm working, I'm saying, anytime I'm going to be working with server counter, I'm going to be using this lock. And the lock that I decided to use on this particular example was server object to lock. Oh, OK. But you don't have to be locking the object that you're doing calculation on. No. Okay. Uh, it's usually good practice if you can, okay. if the calculation happens to be only that particular object that you're modifying. Okay. But, if, if, but if you can't, then you have to come up with something that you just have to consistently use. Oh, that would be like this guy. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's like the benefit, I guess, of doing it that way as opposed to this way? Anyone knows the answer? So in this case, when you click the on the method, then your lock is the class ID generator. So in that case, when you're locking that, that entire class is the lock, that means that I can't call, one thread can't call get next server ID, and another thread can't call next client ID at the same time. Oh, it locks the whole class. Right, the whole class is locked then. So, oh. so that, so you don't want to do that those two methods have nothing to do with each other. You want to be able to run them in parallel. Gotcha. So if you okay. do it in the other way, what's happening is you, you create those objects to make the lock. So that way you can run those two methods in parallel. Oh, I didn't realize it locked the whole class. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. So I that's like you showed me another example earlier where you said doing the synchronize on the method is the same thing as putting a synchronized disk okay. inside the method okay. because then your lock is the class. Oh. Actually, you should be careful with the word Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, it makes me so proud. Wow. <laughs> no, but that's, he's right. No. Okay, yeah. Both of them are right. <laughs>
No, definitely. Yeah, and actually, yeah, I'll open that. You know, I think, we, I mean, I have enough time for questions if there are questions. Yes. Yes. Okay, let's start with you. If you have a singleton? I mean, if you're working on any type of variable within that server, and 100 requests come in and work on that variable, how is that? Um, <laughs> well, uh, from what I read, and, and I have to say, my, my I am more of a J2C by trade. But from what I was reading about it, um, EE makes certain guarantees if you have, um, if you have like a, a request, and this request is, if this request is using a variable that is shared across the framework, but you get this variable in a specific way that J2EE allows you to get it, then, then I think you're fine. Because they, they, they are very specific on not worrying about threading at all unless you really need to. Which makes me think, unless you're doing something that is not normal or it feels weird, like having a singleton. A singleton will be an example where I'll start being worried about. Like, there's an object that is get instance and they everybody calls a get instance, and yeah, I think you're definitely running into trading issues. But if you have a variable that is Spring makes available to you by using a certain method, probably Spring took care of the of the synchronization and 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 object trading for you to have that object in a nice consistent state. Um, I would not not expert. I'll have to look it up, but that's what we're good at. Huh? Next session. Next session. Yes. <laughs> Let me just get my Spring hat for a little bit. You had a question. <laughs>